we are three days away from our JDRF One Walk. We're very excited. This will be our 14th walk, and we're excited to do it um, in person this year. Last year was a virtual walk, and we had our team at our house because of COVID. But, <laughs> but this year we are walking at the zoo. Um, different teams are meeting there at the zoo to walk this year. Um, Saturday, October 2nd, starting at 10. If you'd like to come to the walk and hang out at the zoo for, with your family, um, reach out to me and I'll tell you how you can do that. We're really excited about it. But today we wanted to talk to you a little bit about why walk season is so important to us and why we do this every year, why, why we've been doing this for this, this is the 14th year. Um, Rhett was diagnosed um, back in 2008 when he was four years old. It's a long time ago, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, that was 13 and a half years ago. Um, and so I wanted to kind of give a refresher for those of you who don't know our story. Um, I've said it a lot, but some of you may not know our story about how uh, diabetes came into our life. So like I said, uh, Rhett was four years old when he was diagnosed and he was in preschool, hadn't gone to kindergarten yet. And um, fortunately we had a, a sweet, wonderful preschool teacher um, who knew a little bit about type one. Her sister had type one. And so um, she had pulled me over a couple couple days and said, you know, Deborah, Rhett is really, really thirsty today. He's really just kind of tired and thirsty and you know I would just brush it off and say oh he had pancakes for breakfast or, or whatever and uh, so finally the day before I took him to the pediatrician she said he didn't play at all today he was if he wasn't at the water fountain he was at the bathroom and she said Deborah I really think you need to get him checked out um, she said you know this this could be diabetes and I didn't really you know I hadn't how could a kid have diabetes? I, you know, to me, it was the Wilford Brimley disease. And so I, I didn't really know anything about it. Um, of course, you know, you Google it. And even, even back then, Google was kind of a place that you would look and find scary things. And, um, and I was like, well, I, I don't know this. I don't know if this is it or not, but it could be. So we had already had an appointment uh, for, for him. And so we took him to the pediatrician the next day and they checked his blood sugar and it didn't register on their meter. Now I know that that means he was over 600, uh, but at the time I didn't have a clue what that meant. And um, he's, uh, his, our doctor said to us, you've got time, uh, I don't want you to panic, but I want you to go home and I want you to pack a bag and I want you to head to Vanderbilt. I'm gonna call them and tell them you're on your way. Of course that scared the mess out of me and I took, I'd take a minute in the doctor's office he told me that it was type 1 diabetes and you can't get the official diagnosis to get all the blood work done but I mean he already knew um, and so I called Scott and cried and did all those things um, and we went home and got a bag and uh, we went off to Vanderbilt uh, the, the older boys were in school and uh, so we just went on and texted them and let them know what was going on and a matter of fact, Robbie had a, his first home baseball game of the season that day. So that was a little rough on him. And um, Ryan went over to a friend's house afterwards. And, I, you know, it was a little rough on both of them that day. But anyway, we got to the hospital, and they did the blood work. And his blood sugar was 733, I think. 733 is what I think. What, what, oh, it's hard to remember now. All the numbers run together after a while. But it was over 700. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they told us that we were very fortunate. He was not in DKA, which is diabetic ketone, D ketoacidosis. There we go. And, um, that's, that's bad. Um, that, that's what leads to a diabetic coma. And unfortunately, a lot of times people do not know that their kid or adult even, because we're, we're diagnosing them later and later, but, um, that they, they don't even know their loved one has it until they're in DKA. We were fortunate enough that Rhett did, was not in DKA. Uh, the unfortunate part about that was they didn't keep him. So they um, they did an IV, they did a drip, and got him on some insulin. Um, and honestly, I, one of the things I remember the most about that particular day was almost seeing life come back into him the minute that he got the insulin. And 
even though I was just devastated at this new normal that we were facing and, and that, you know, they had already assured us this was a lifelong disease until we found a cure, if they ever found a cure. Um, and so this was not going away. This was not something he was going to outgrow. But all of a sudden when I saw him kind of perk up, I knew we were going to be okay because I knew what we were dealing with. And I knew that, you know, you don't, it, 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 diabetes is not something that just attacks all at once. Um, there's a trigger. It's an autoimmune disease um, and, and you have antibodies and something triggers it to react and start attacking the cells in your pancreas that make insulin. And uh, we, we think we know what his was. We're not 100% sure, but he did have a febrile seizure six months prior to his diagnosis. And we think that was his trigger. Um, but so it took six months for him to get to a point where we were worried enough to take him to the doctor. But you know, in that amount of time, you don't notice the changes, the loss of weight, the using the bathroom all the time, the, the, the frequent thirst, because it, it gradually increases. And so, yeah, he's drinking a lot, but he's been drinking a lot for a while. And then he just happens to be drinking so much, that's all he ever wants to do. Um, so most people come into it kind of that way. But anyway, like I said, um, I knew we were gonna be okay because I could see life back in him but they sent us home that night. And so we had to take our four year old baby home and give him shots on the very first night. And you talk about terrifying. That was exceptionally terrifying, but we got through that and we came back to Vanderbilt the next day and we spent all day um, in classes learning how to, to give insulin and to, to do all the things that we needed to do. Um, emergency shots and checking blood sugar and all of those things. And here we are. 13 and a half years later, and now he does a whole lot of it by himself. So, um, what are some of the things that you do to take care of your diabetes? A bolus. Um, bolus is, is a, insulin. Yeah, bolus, insulin. bolus is a diabetes verb for giving insulin. It's like dosing, but we call it bolus. Go ahead. Um, I check my blood sugar. Um, if my sensor is down, then if I'm not feeling too well, then I have to go check my blood sugar. And usually, a lot of times, it says it's low. I might in the 60s or whatever so I didn't get a juice at that point okay and um, regular or normal blood sugar range should be somewhere between 70 and 110 um, for Rhett uh, his doctor would like it to be uh, anywhere between 80 they like it to be a little bit higher 80 to uh, his, his range was 80 to 180 now we're they like us to be closer to 80 to 150 if possible um, that's not a very easy goal, <laughs> no, <it's> but <laughs> right. But we do the best we can. Um, on, on average, he does that. On average, he keeps it under 150. But there's a whole lot of roller coasters going on in the in the process because yep. everything affects blood sugar, right? Yep. It's not just the food you eat; it's the mood you're in. If you're in a bad mood, it might affect it. If you're really excited, it might affect it. If you are gro if you're going through a growth spurt, it really affects it. Mm -hmm. Sickness affects it, all kinds of things. So, um, so it's a it's a kind of a roller coaster thing. Robbie's story is a little bit different. Robbie was a freshman in college at MTSU, and he had just finished his first year of college. And he came home, and we stayed home for the summer. And we had a whole lot of water left because we had done a diabetes walk at Hendersonville High School earlier in the spring, and I had I don't know three or four cases of water left. And not too long after he had been home. I, I kind of did that little mama fussing thing. I marched into the living room one day and I was like, where is all the water gone? And Robbie just kind of laughed and said, well, I've just been thirsty lately and I, I have, I've had most of it. And I said, well, you probably ought to check your sugar. And I was just really kidding. But that night we went to bed and Robbie was still, because, you know, he was a teenager, he was still wide awake. And he went and borrowed Rhett's uh, meter and checked his own blood sugar. And it was over 200, 250, I believe. And he um, didn't wake us up. I'm sure that was a um, jaunting thought about what he was about to experience, because he knew. Um, and he told me the next morning. Um, and so I was, even then I was in denial. I was like, well, you didn't check your finger right. I mean, your sugar right. You must have sugar on your finger or something. Go wash your hands. So I made him wash his hands. I took an alcohol wipe. I wiped his finger off. I checked his sugar and it was 252. I remember that. 252. So um, 
I knew what we were dealing with and I called Vanderbilt and off we went. Um, and the uh, uh, executive director of JDRF met us at the hospital. That's how important JDRF is to us. Um, and so uh, those are our stories about how we, we uh, live with type one diabetes. Our middle son, Ryan, does not have it, thankfully. Um, but we still have to be really careful because we have friends that were diagnosed well into their 20s. Ryan is 26. I've even heard some people being diagnosed in their 40s and 50s and even 60s. Um, it's just, it, we know more about it now. Um, and you know how autoimmune diseases are kind of running rampant these days? We're not really sure why. Uh, so it's, it's much more common than you might think. Um, so that's our story of diagnosis. And we've been living with type one in our family for 13 and a half years. Robbie's had it for 11 years. Um, and we've been trying to find a tangible way to make a difference. It, sometimes that, that disease feels like it's just completely in control. And one way that we have felt like we could have a little bit of control is by doing the diabetes walks. And so we've done that every year and we're going to do it again this year. So we're excited about that. Um, I'm even, it's walk week, so I've been wearing my JDRF shirts whenever I can. I had to change kiss my pancreas, showed on yesterday. Later on, I'm going to do my color streak nails. Shout out to Amanda. Thank you very much. I've got my gray and my blue, and then I've got my awareness ribbons that are going to go on over that because uh, type uh, type 1 diabetes awareness ribbons are uh, come in blue and, and gray. That's our colors for type 1 diabetes awareness. So I'm going to have my little ribbons on my nails for that. I'm excited about that. <laughs> so, Rhett, let's talk real quick about some things about diabetes. What's one thing that you just really do not like about diabetes? Blues. Low blood Blues. sugar because I have to stop what I'm doing. Like if I'm throwing the football and it goes low, then I have to stop and wait for 10 minutes. At least, right? At least. Because sometimes they're stubborn and they take a while. Yes. Uh, so, like, how do you feel when you're low? Eh, I feel like I'm going to fall or whatever. Feel shaky? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes, like, you're dizzy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, a low blood sugar will make you feel sweaty and shaky and dizzy. I think most of us have had where we hadn't had enough food and we've got the, the shakes. Those are That's a low blood sugar. Um, and severe uh, low blood sugars can come on quickly and could cause serious problems. You could pass out, you could have a seizure. In ultimate cases with low blood sugars, you could die. Um, we've never had one that's scary, thankfully. We, we have, and because of walks and, and people who raise money, we have technology that helps us get on top of it before it gets that bad. He, has, uh, he wears a continuous glucose monitor um, and it updates every five minutes. He's using interstitial fluid. Um, so it's not quite as accurate as blood sugar, but it's really close. It's only behind just about five minutes. And so um, it, it uh, lets us know. And so we do so, we try to do something about it before it gets too low, right? We, we see the trends, and if we can catch it, um, we try to do it. But it's a really pain in the summer. Like you, you go, you go lot, low a lot in the summer. The heat makes a difference. You're, you're more active. You're swimming. You have to get out of the pool a lot for it, don't you? Mm -hmm. That's kind of a pain, yep. right? Um, what is one thing that has been a positive about having type 1 diabetes? Um, it's hard to think of any. Yep. <laughs> well, we've met some great people. Yes, we've met some great people yeah. over the years. Right. Um, we did We did catch his appendicitis. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember that. Because his blood sugars were high. And we took him to the hospital thinking he had some sort of virus. And I was just going to... He had ketones, and I was just going to get an IV, and I thought I had it all figured out. We was just going to flush those ketones. We were going to be there a few hours, and they were going to send us home. Well, fortunately, the doctor didn't have tunnel vision like I did, and they checked, and he had um, his appendix needed to come out. And because we got there as quickly as we did, because the blood sugar alerted us, it wasn't an emergency surgery. We had time, nothing ruptured, and everything was fine. However, he did have to stay, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a fairly simple surgery, but he did have to stay overnight because he did have type 1 diabetes and they wanted to make sure that everything was safe. So, okay. So, what is one thing that you would do if we got a cure for diabetes? Drink regular Coke. <laughs> Drink regular Coke instead of Diet Coke. Yep. I can understand that. And you Drink can, regular Sprite, too. And regular Sprite. I get that. I mean, we use those in case we have a low occasionally, but we don't really have a bunch of those in our house, do we? Nope. So, and uh, we, we use juice boxes most of the time to 
there's a juice box shortage going on right now. Yes, there is. There so, is a juice uh, box shortage. Which is the craziest thing, it's almost as crazy as toilet paper, but there's a juice box shortage. Um, we, we were fortunate enough to find a case on Amazon that was in stock, and we got ours, so we're good. But um, anyway, just the craziness of that. So um, let's get back to the walk. Saturday, October 2nd at the Nashville Zoo starting at 10. The walk is from 10 to noon, but you're welcome to stay all day. Um, if you would like to know more about it, please comment or text me or call me or email me or whatever, however you can get a hold of me, and I'll be happy to tell you about it. Um, we've reached out to some new families this week that I think are going to get to join us that um, haven't been able to participate because since September of 19, we haven't really gotten together because of COVID. So, so some of the people that were diagnosed in that time haven't had any community whatsoever other than maybe social media. So I'm really looking forward to, to some, some type one families getting to meet other type one families. And we'd love for you to come support those families if, if you can. Um, and much like the rest of the world, COVID has really hit the, the JDRF and the and the type 1 diabetes world hard and it's been hard y'all um, I'm not gonna lie um, we as an as an organization JDRF had to to uh, let go of about half of their staff and I'm not talking locally I'm talking nationally and there are a lot of people that I love that don't work for JDRF anymore and because of COVID um, and that's just one of the honest realities. Um, you know, as a donor, I'm glad that they're being smart with the money. I mean, 80, 80 cents of every dollar goes directly to research. And in order to keep that, they have to keep things tight. But when things shut down and you can't have events, it's hard to have fundraisers. So the last year and a half has just been really rough. Um, also, research just kind of came to a halt when they were looking for a vaccine for COVID. And so we're a couple years behind. We're not behind, but we kind of stopped where we were in 19 in the early part of 20, and we're just now getting back and grooving. And that hurts when you're you're talking about life-altering research, the projects that were going on, and some that have already been in the works for several years, just having to stop. So we took a hit. We took a hit financially. We took a hit personnel. We took a hit research-wise. And as somebody who really wants their kids cured quickly. It's hurt my feelings. I'll just be honest with you. I'm ready to get back to pushing research to what it, where it needs to be, and we need your help. Our goal for our team is ten thousand dollars, and I checked just probably about ten minutes before we did this video, and on our site it said we had over eighty six hundred dollars. No, over eighty seven hundred dollars, and I have received three hundred more dollars in the mail, so we are over nine thousand. So we are less than a thousand away from our goal. And we have until Saturday. Actually, we probably have till a little after Saturday, but we can hit it. Um, I know $1,000 seems like a lot, and I'm going to tell you, a week ago, I didn't think we were going to get there. We were probably like $3,000 a week ago. That's how much we've raised in a week. Um, and so I know we can do it. And we just it just takes people like you who, who hear our story and want to make a difference. And you can make a difference. We have seen personally... The people that walked before us and the stuff we've done in the middle, how much it has changed technology for our boys. And it has made life so much easier. You know, we used to get up at 2.30 every single morning to check his sugar. We don't do that anymore. We get to sleep unless alarms go off. And that's because of the technology and thanks to people like you who have donated every year. Your $5 does matter. It really does. So we would love for you to, to help us out. If you've already given, I thank you so, so much. And if you want to give five bucks more, I will take your five bucks. If you haven't given, please consider. Please prayerfully consider if you could help. And I promise you're giving to a great organization. Over 80 cents of every dollar goes directly towards research. So thanks for watching. I know this was long. Rhett, thanks for hanging out with me. You're welcome. Thanks for editing the video. You're welcome part of his videography class at homeschool today and so thank you so much thank y'all for watching we hope to see you saturday and let's cure this